It's good to get the band back together, isn't it? And this is just, uh, I've missed y'all a lot and uh, missed just being with each other. One of the things that, um, if, if this is your first time, or even if it's just, um, you've, you've been coming um, time and time again, I don't know what it takes to get here for you. And I don't just mean if you have children and want to, you know, commit homicide on the way here, um, that, that's a, the struggle's real, I get it. Um, but like, to get here, um, to, to be here today, I don't know what it's taken uh, for you. I don't know what you've walked through this summer um, with family, with your own personal stuff, with business, with um, things that some people will never know about. And so um, often I show up at church with um, this stuff I don't know what to do with, and there's a part of me, it's like, um, it's like behind the curtain is where a lot of my life exists. And there's a part of me when I show up at church that holds a symbol of kind of the stuff I'm struggling with and this like hand emerges out of the curtain, you know, towards God, like, could, could you do something about this? And so um, partly what we're doing at the crossing is trying to um, not just yank the curtain back, but just to kind of just stay to everyone. We've all got that curtain. We've all got that stuff that um, we walk in here with that we're just kind of holding out as um, bravely and as desperately as we can, asking God, hey, could, could maybe you do something about this? And um, that takes a lot of courage. Um, and it takes a lot of um, honesty and vulnerability. And so I just want to say thanks for being here. And... Um, um, and so, and I also want to say the folks around you are, um, uh, are, are walking with uh, and walking through things that we don't know about, um, you know. Uh, and so uh, because of that, um, one of the things I came across a Ram Das quote last year that's really become kind of a, a probably a tattoo I'll get someday on my body. But it says, uh, uh, he said, um, at the end of the day, all we're doing is walking each other home. And I think that's the spiritual life, is that you don't get a bunch of points for all the information. There's not like a quiz at the end that we're going to hand folks or God doesn't get up and say, you know, it really at the end of the day is how can we take each other's hand and how can we let each other in on some of the things that happen behind the curtain and how do we just take each other's hand there and just walk each other down the road a little. Um, and so uh, some of us in this um, this class and in this community are attempting to do that at a, um, at a deeper place. Um, so um, just a couple of things before we kind of jump into everything. Um, this picture here, that's probably really bad quality too. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a ministry that's in, it's a boxing ministry that's in uh, Spring Branch of a bunch of uh, mainly Hispanic kids. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I've gotten to know this, the, the guy that runs this thing, and it's for kids in the neighborhood. It was so hot, it was so hot for those of you who uh, were in Houston this, uh, this summer. Like 106 is a little like, it felt a little personal after a while, you know, I don't know about y'all. But um, um, these kids needed a pool. And so at the end of uh, um, kind of uh, the beginning of the summer, our Sunday school class, we just got together and we donated funds to allow uh, a pool to be uh, created in this, uh, in this place about three miles from here. And so I wanted to say thank you for everyone that uh, participated, that prayed, that gave, that um, um, Susie Johnson shows up, showed up and wanted to like, do an underground pool. And, that, and it was just amazing just the, like, just the openness that people have to folks in our community. And so that is, uh, I was there on Friday and there were about uh, 15 kids in the pool and uh, they, it was just, it was amazing. So, uh, um, Really amazing. So it was just great. Um, and like uh, Philip said, we're going to do songs that saved my life. Uh, six or so songs that um, that 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 I think um, have, have helped me spiritually kind of grow deeper. And uh, and we'll talk about the the root of that. Then after that, we're going to do the uh, the gospel according to Ted Lasso. Um, <laughs> 
I was thinking about uh, entitling it uh, one of the ones on forgiveness, the other F word, if you've ever watched Ted Lasso. So, um, but uh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I want to do something called a Christian, atheist, and Buddhist walk into a bar. Uh, I, what do we do with other religions or no religion at all? Um, and so um, I know that I grew up in a place that was super policing the borders of what was right, wrong, what was good, bad, what was right to think about, not right to think about. So what it meant to go to hell is that you had the wrong thoughts about God. And so is that it? So I, I want to just ask some questions that maybe don't get asked in church and uh, maybe get excommunicated along with some other folks. So <laughs> that will be maybe the last uh, uh, series I ever do at Chapelwood or anywhere. So uh, y'all want to show up for the house fire there. So um, that'd be great. Uh, and this week uh, we'll do songs that saved uh, my life. And so we're going to sing. Uh, I don't I don't. Uh, we're going to, as Philip said, we're going to go through. Um, you can't always get what you want. Uh, or the importance of disappointment. Uh, and we're going to talk about the spirituality of disappointment and what happens when uh, we get disappointed. And so this, uh, uh, this is a song we'll do. And we're going to sing it together. So can you all give Sam and, uh, and Jeff a hand? Let's do it. Now listen, this is a sing-along, folks, all right? So let's go. You're going to realize how... Dumb these lyrics. Are. <laughs> no, they they're, they're not, they're not the it. best lyrics. I want to hear how Matt spiritualizes <laughs> that Mick Jagger's favorite flavor is cherry red, because that's my favorite line of the whole song. So enjoy singing this. Saw her today at the reception. A glass of wine in a hay. Who she gon' meet her connection At a feet was footloose me Here we go Can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want Ooh. Can't always get what you want but if you try, sometimes you find you get what you need. So I went down to the demonstration to get my fair share of abuse. Sing, we gon' vent our frustration And if we do, we'll blow a 50 amp for you Can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want but if you try sometime, you find you get what you need. Here's the deep step. So I went down to the Chelsea drugstore to get my prescription fit. I was standing in line with Mr. Jimmy And man, did he look pretty So I decided we would have a soda Ooh, my favorite flavor, cherry red I sung my song to Mr. Jimmy and the word he said to me was, Dad, can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. Ooh, you can't always get what you want. 
But if you try sometime, you find you get what you need. Can't always get what you want. Can't always get what you want. Can't always get what you want. But if you try, sometimes you find you get what you I, I saw a meme. Hey, thanks, y'all. Yeah. These, these folks are going to come back. We're going to try to do a little singing every, uh, um, uh, every uh, Sunday we meet, so I uh, really appreciate y'all. Um, I saw a meme uh, this last week where, uh, was, it, um, was it Mick Jagger and uh, Willie Nelson, a picture of them, and, they, and it said, y'all really need to think, y'all young people really need to think about the world you're leaving us, you know, and I thought that was awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, the fact that Mick Jagger can still move like he, he does. So, um, so today what we're, we're going to do is we're going to kind of unpack this in, in um, this song that I hope sticks with you. You know, I hope it doesn't, I hope it becomes a, like, what is that, the wormhole kind of song? Uh, because I think um, it needs to work on us a little. There's an idea about spirituality that um, I think is kind of first half of life, more of a young way of looking at spirituality as if um, um, Jesus is some kind of like GNC supplement that we take, right? And I just need to kind of get over the hump, and Jesus is here to help me get over the hump. Right. Um, Or to um, just kind of provide that last little two or three percent of stuff that I can't figure out on my own. Um, And so often what we do is that our spirituality becomes something that sits on the side of our lives rather than something we're cultivating as a way of seeing our entire life. The spirituality becomes something that we use as a bypass um, to an easier life. Rather than maybe, if we look at the life of Jesus, if we look at the life of mystics, if we look at the life of our own selves, we begin to see that this very person um, of Jesus, the life that he lived, may have something to say um, to our life. And so this idea of you can't always get what you want or the importance of disappointment, there's a, this is a book title by the name, uh, a guy named Ian Krebb. Um, and um, it's a great, great book. It's not a very popular book. It's a more academic book, and, um, but it's really fantastic. I read it when I was in my PhD program, and I just thought, wow, I've never looked at um, holding life like this. And so I think there's a deep spiritual thing that's, um, um, that's underneath it. And so we're going to uh, look at that today. Um, Tom, would you read to us the text that, and wow, that's really small, isn't it? <laughs> You just have to, I promise you, this is what it, uh, Tom's about to read. <laughs> we'll start with Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then John 11, on his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Why are you downcast, O my soul, is what David says. That's just not poetry. It's probably a question that um, each of us have struggled with at some point. Why why are you downcast? 
a lot of times our life moves at such a pace that we don't even ask that question sometimes. And that we can be like five years deep into a behavior, 10 years deep into a behavior, 25 years deep into a behavior, and wonder, why am I doing this? Right? Um, in the program I work, they call that insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, not aware of why I'm doing it, trying to fix something that this behavior cannot fix. Anybody here struggle with any kind of that thing? Okay. As, um, and so that's, I think that's what it means to be human. You know, I think that's what it means to be human is that it takes us a while to become aware, to notice, right? That's why I think one of the most uh, important, and we'll talk about this in the gospel according to Tad, Ted Lasso. I don't want to give it too much away. But that's why I think the spiritual discipline of curiosity is probably the most important spiritual discipline, capacity that we can develop as human beings, is just asking the question, why? Right? Paul said this, why do I do the things I don't want to do? Right? The way that that was handed to me was that, like, well, because you're, you're an ugly sinner, that's why. I mean, that's, I mean, you can read the Bible that way. I did for a long time. Not so helpful, right? <laughs> but to ask the question, why am I doing this? And to have maybe a brother or a sister that can, you can go to and say, hey, I don't know why I'm doing this. And to have someone come alongside of you that would begin to help you do that help you understand that, is really helpful at the end of the day, right? Um, um, and this is what, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit's role is in the life of the church is called the paraclete, the one that comes alongside. Not to put his, uh, 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 the, the Spirit's like, thumb on the smite button of your life, or the shame button, but to help free us, right? I'll say it over and over and over again. The whole intent of God in the spiritual life is for more interior freedom. That's the goal of the spiritual life. It's not so you're right and you answer a bunch of questions at the end and everybody else gets to burn in hell, but you answer the questions right so you get to go to the happy place. That's not it. It's so that you might have life, as Jesus said, and that just like springing out of your gut more abundantly. And that means that, that um, I think that there's capacities that we can learn as human beings, as, as a community, as people that allow us to live more freely, less in denial, less angry, less reactive. Um, and so I think that that's the goal of the spiritual life, that we could be, become more free. And there's a, there's a price of that that we'll, um, that, we'll, um, that we'll talk about in that. But um, I think that disappointment is a part of um, all of our lives. Um, we've prayed for people, and um, often the opposite has happened. We've watched people die, children, folks that we love. We've stood, some of us, in front of judges and have heard the divorce decree. We've stood over businesses that we want to work out and we've struggled. We've wanted to get um, positions in companies and um, um, we've wanted things to work out in a way that would really benefit us and our families and they haven't. We've applied to schools and have opened up some of us those rejection letters. And so disappointment really is, um, um, is woven through our lives. It's a part of um, the human experience. And the question I think that I often have in that, and I think the, the spiritual question that we have to ask, is how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the disappointment that we often um, face? Um, my sponsor uh, in the 12 Steps would say that really um, um, it's because of the expectations I have. That often our expectations for something um, and the reality of what that thing can actually give me are out of whack. Does that make sense? That I'm going to go on this vacation. Oh, I did that this summer, dudes. Totally did that. This vacation is going to give me everything that I need. It would have if my boys weren't with me, right? <laughs> totally would have been awesome, you know? But I got these little people that have needs in my life, right? 
And so what I was hoping was going to happen, and what happened, there was like a, a big gap in the middle of that. And so often um, what happens in those things is that um, um, resentment will come out of that. But often it's resentment that emerges out of the place of the expectations um, that we have. Um, um, my sponsor will say that often expectations are just resentments waiting to happen, right? And so I expect people in my life to do certain things, particularly people very close to me, particularly my wife and my children and my friends. And when they don't reach up to those expectations, often um, my soul gets hurt and I can begin to have this little um, um, pity party of one. <laughs> Matt Russell, pity party of one, call him, right? And I, <laughs> And it's like, and I begin to unconsciously, this is, this is I don't know if y'all are like this, it can, it can act as conscious thoughts, but unconsciously I can begin to amass details of why all y'all are not doing it right. And if y'all would do it right, my life would be easier and y'all's life would be easier, <laughs> right? And so I can just, I can live with that energy without being aware of that energy, why are you downcast, oh, my soul? Because my friggin' wife isn't doing it right, y'all. Right? Is, is the truth response that then, thank you for the laughter, because it's, it's laughable. When the things that come up that we think, oh, I want this to take care of all of this, and it's not designed to. And so often when our expectations of what we want and the reality of what we're asking those things to give us, a vacation that's going to be super amazingly blah, blah, blah. Oh, I know what this is going to be. And it doesn't line up. We have a gap in the middle of disappointment. Um, and that can happen in everything and in anything um, that we do, that, that gap that we often live in. Um, and often what um, um, I think that underneath that for me is that I want, I want to live in this dichotomy of all good or all bad. I want it to be all good. And when it's not all good, well, I guess it's just all bad. And I can do that with people. We can do that with folk, people in our lives. We can do that with situations in our lives. We talk about plan B. And so we can live within that energy of our expectations and the reality that those things cannot give us, and then we can live within the gap and just cultivate resentment. We can cultivate depression. It's not going to work out. I'm doing all this work. It's not going to work out. And in, it can become a bit of a, a dark place for us. Um, does, that, does that make any sense? Okay. Um, and what I have begun to see the truth is, is that really disappointment is unavoidable. If you're human, and if you've got a, a heart that's beating in your chest right now, um, what it means to experience disappointment as a human being is unavoidable. Um, how we react is huge, though. How we notice, how we get curious and notice how we react is really important. That's the spiritual path. The spiritual path allows us to notice um, without judgment, without kind of hitting the shame button or making you all bad and me all good in our lives and be able to notice as a, almost like a, um, an enlightened witness, to become an enlightened witness in your own life is part of the spiritual path that we're on to say, hmm, why do I do that? Why do I react that way? Why, when I'm in Montana, do I want to strangle my, my boys? Hmm, why? Why am I digging the shallow grave? I don't, you know, what? Whatever that is. To be able to ask that I did not do that. And actually, my vacation with my boys was actually great. And uh, they're wonderful. And I do want to kill them sometimes. So that's the truth about me. 
Often, uh, though, how we react is a huge part. There's a guy named Anthony Giddens who is um, a really an amazing thinker in uh, the 20th century. Uh, and he, um, he writes um, about our own development as human beings in, in, in modernity, in, in the West, and how we develop culturally. And one of the things he talks about is the fact that often we have this idea about ourselves that um, what he calls the a powerful self. That since we have been born, we're kind of given this idea about ourselves that we can do anything. That we are powerful beyond recognition, right? And I think some of that is not wrong, but often that's the, when we come up against the things that we're disappointed in or the gaps that we're pointed in, what we end up doing is employing this powerful self to try to fix the thing in the gap. And often, it's counterintuitive, but the the thing what we're attempting to do with the powerful self is to make sure that we have our, um, what he talks about, this this deep emotional satisfaction in everything. And what the self is supposed to do is to make your life emotionally satisfactory in everything. When I read that, I was like, dang. Dang. That sounds a lot the way that I think behind the curtain of my life. Is that if I was powerful enough, if I was doing it right, even spiritually, if I could get everybody on board with me and what they all ought to do in my little sphere of control and influence, that I could could live a satisfied life. And the reason I'm not living a satisfied life is because I'm not making enough money or because these yahoos aren't doing it right, right? Right? If I was different, if you were different. And so we come into our lives with this idea of the powerful self that needs to then be employed in the gaps of our life. And we can become very, very either, I think that's bipolar in this way, either very controlling. Controlling everything and everyone in our lives. Or we become very despondent and depressed. And often we can experience those two energies in the same day. Can I get an amen about that? Is anybody yeah. right? Right? That, that that can happen to us. Because the ways that we have understood ourselves is this movement is that we are very powerful. And that we should live in this emotionally, this place of emotional satisfaction, complete satisfaction. And one of the questions that Giddon says that we ask ourselves all the time is, is everything okay? Constantly monitoring ourselves. We ask our spouse, our children, you all right? Everything okay? You okay? I, I noticed I do that all the time with my boys. You okay? But you okay? You, Tom, you okay? We okay? Because the... The energy underneath that is um, this feeling and this fear that we're not going to be satisfied. And that really, it's up to us to achieve that satisfaction. And that when we feel disappointed, it feels like a red flag that says, you suck, it's all going down, it's not going to work out, there's a problem here. And that we get really busy spinning our wheels towards our own satisfaction. And that in modernity, we live lives that are um, at such a pitched movement. We move so quickly because underneath the subterranean parts of our lives, of our spirit, there is a fear that it's not going to work out. There's a fear that we will not be satisfied. And so then often we can be involved in relationships where it's the other person's uh, role to satisfy us. There's something wrong in our relationship. I'm just not getting my needs met. I'm not saying that some of us don't and aren't. But often what we do is that we project that onto other people to meet our needs. And so we have this idea of the magical other. Because I know how screwed up I am. I was just hoping Michelle wouldn't be as screwed up as me. <laughs> and that, that if she did it right, her life a little better, that my life would get better. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so often what we can do is we can project our own dissatisfaction, dis-ease. Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Jesus, if you would have showed up five minutes earlier, but you're late, and I feel deeply disappointed in you. And so we walk around with spiritual disappointment, disappointment in our own relationships, disappointment with the way that our lives have the tendency to work out. And often we image manage in front of each other in this place in a way that we don't know necessarily how to talk about it, but I want to make sure that you think that my life is as I projected on Facebook. Right? And so we come here with our little hand sticking out of the curtain, you know, and with the kind of black kind of what the heck do I do with my life? And we hold it out before God and we say, can you do anything about this? Because that's our deepest fear, that the things that are running underneath our life that God won't see and that we won't have resources to maybe um, move in a different way in our life. That, to me, I think, is part of the spiritual dilemma of our age. And I think that often we come into crossroads. Um, we stand at the crossroads. And often we have to, and this is kind of the, the what was that movie, Red Pill, Blue Pill thing? What was that? The Matrix. The Matrix. That's a great movie. Maybe it was great when I was younger. I just, I love that movie. But that idea that I could take a pill and just stay in willful ignorance, just don't knowing anything. Or I can begin a pathway that might say, oh, it's not like that. This is the same thing um, in, um, in Jeremiah. Jeremiah took the pill that woke him up as a prophet. And he says to Yahweh, you seduced me. I thought when I was going to follow you, man, I was going to be able to mow down my enemies. I was going to have, I was going to, I was going to come with an amazing kind of uh, retirement plan. You seduced me. It's a lot harder than I thought. And so often our spiritual life puts us on a path where um, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. And we begin to have to look at our lives, the social construction of our own relationships, why our own soul is downcast, why we have the tendency to project on other people and ask other people to give us things. And that often our disappointment, we don't know what to do with, so we increase our speed. We try to make more. We try to control more. And all along the way, I believe that part of what the invitation to do with our disappointment is to slow down and to stop and to ask the question that David asked this morning, why are you downcast? Why? And begin to see the way that we have constructed our own lives, our own relationships, our own desires as a way to attempt to always be completely satisfied in everything. And the part of a mature spirituality says that there's going to be mess in life and that we have to live with mess. I don't know about the mess you're in, if you have to live with that. Does that make sense? I don't know because there's times that you need to step out. There's times that you have to do things that you realize, oh, I don't have to live like this. But even knowing that you have to make a decision to do something else doesn't mean it's going to get easier. Doesn't mean it's rainbows and unicorns. Doesn't mean that the ball drops and the confetti comes down and somebody comes with a big check, right? It's not that at all. It just means that the exact nature of your own life you begin to take um, stock in and account for and you begin to ask, okay, this is going to be tough. It's not all good. It's not all bad. It's just kind of messy. And I think the spiritual, um, the spiritual path of disappointment, of knowing that you can't always get what you want, you can try sometimes. 
but you can get what you need. Everybody in this room can get what they need. And often that starts with um, this process, I think, of surrendering. Let me, let me just share what I think are a couple of different um, um, processes or pathways to um, um, the crossroads that they're on. And I'll, I'll close here in the next uh, 45 minutes. Um, uh, <laughs> I just looked at the clock. I'm like, whoa, okay. Um, blue pill, red pill. You can keep doing the same thing you're doing. Increase your speed. Keep drinking. Keep just filling it up with stuff. Keep making it everybody else's problem. Keep doing that. that, that that's, we we kind of know where that goes. The other path is, I think, this path um, of, of more vulnerable surrender of maturity, and, it, and it's, it's ugly. It, it's, it's not fun. It's not pretty, but it is real. And I think it begins with acceptance. Accepting life on life's terms. Accepting that this is who you are and where you are and the exact nature of what's happening in your life. Accepting. Acceptance. Acceptance does not mean resignation. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean, well, I just guess it's just going to suck all my life. <laughs> that, that, that's not acceptance. What acceptance is, is that often there can be a resistance that says, I don't like this. I don't like it like this. And I don't like you like this. And we can begin to resist the exact thing that's happening in our life. So part of it, um, part of what we have to do and, and need to do is to understand this whole movement of acceptance. Oh, it's just like this. And um, there is a whole spiritual pathway of learning about these things, journaling these things, meeting with other people that we, we come to accept that this is where I'm at. We can become to uh, uh, the place of accepting this is how I am in the situation that I'm in. This is how I occur. These are the defense systems that I have. This is the way that I move in the world. We, we become the enlightened witness of our own life in non-judgmental ways so that we can see our life. And in the midst of that acceptance, it leads us to surrender. That we begin then to surrender to the very deep love of God. Because often in the first half of our lives, our spirituality is really what we want God to do and to be is this like cosmic Coke machine. That if I show up at church and I read my Bible and I'm a good enough person, I can punch it and something's going to drop out when I need it. And that we have this real kind of weird relationship with God. Where if um, Paula de Arce is right, that often God comes disguised as your own life. And that God's not going to rapture you out of your own life. The Jesus that we meet over and over and over in the Gospels, the Yahweh, the God that we meet in the Old Testament and in the Hebrew Scriptures, is a God that continues to move towards humanity, finally embedding God's very self within the, the flesh of what it means to be human, finally saying, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, that's where I am. And so we show up in the variability and the mess of our own life, surrendering these things to God, saying, God, I surrender this to you. I don't know the way forward. I know I have a lot of expectations for these people in my life. I know I feel deeply dissatisfied. I know that underneath it, I feel like that I'm supposed to be powerful enough to satisfy everything. And I'm not. And that often the first step towards this kind of spirituality is acceptance, surrender. And then we'll talk about gratitude uh, another time. Um, can y'all stay with me for two more minutes? Sure. I want to teach you a spiritual practice that has revolutionized my life. This is only going to cost you $19.95, so go... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, uh, this is called, again, darn it. The, 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 um, I have, uh, if you want one of these, I'm going to put them up here. Um, and this is called the welcoming prayer. So what do you do when you're downcast, oh, my soul? Okay? The welcoming prayer is a way that I have found that has been deeply helpful. And this is, this is, this is what it says. I want you to, to close your eyes and just listen to this. Um, have in your mind's eye. I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read it through twice. Just I'm going to walk through like we're walking through a park and um, just notice some of the words in it. And next we'll do something else about it. Um, take a breath and just let it out and just become present. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me in this moment because I know it is for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for security. I let go of my desire for approval. I let go of my desire for control. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or myself. I open to the presence and love of God and the healing action and grace within. I want you to think about in this. I'm going to read it one more time. We're going to pray it together, not out loud. But we're going to walk through this. I want you to think about something in your life that is a sticky point for you right now that's causing you a sense that maybe there's something wrong. It shouldn't be like this. Maybe you feel disappointed in somebody in your life. Maybe you feel disappointed in yourself. Maybe you're facing a situation and you're up against something and the best you can do is just put your hand out behind the curtain of your life towards God saying, can you do anything about this? Whatever that is, just hold that tenderly uh, before God um, and let's walk through this. Don't run from it and don't fight it. Stay with this until you really experience a connection to the feeling or emotion. Um, Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me in this moment because I know it is for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations and conditions. I let go of my desire for security. I let go of my desire for approval. I let go of my desire for control. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or myself.
I open to the love and presence of God. And the healing action and grace within. Oh God, we'd ask in the name of Jesus that you would surround us this morning. There have been so many things that we have attempted to resist in our own um, spirits. And as we open to them, we realize that you are there. And that these things are here not to destroy us, but only you can bring the things that make our life a mess. Turn them into an energy that heals us. So come, Holy Spirit. And oh God, I pray that the journey that we go on as a class we all stand at the crossing and that we would be gentle with each other at these crossroads and that we would find each other's hand in the midst of this. Even some of us reaching our hand out behind the curtain of our own lives, might we find another hand that takes it? And might that bring a healing that we've always desired? Thank you for your gentleness, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.